Well, this morning, if you all would open up your Bibles with me to John chapter 19, is where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to go through verses 1 through 16, and uh, I'm going to read if you will follow along. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis or charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From there on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as a stone pavement. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, and crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them for him to be crucified. So what we have here is we actually have a mockery of a trial. Have you ever seen some of your TV shows where things just don't seem fair and just don't go on right? You just have this nice big mockery of a trial, and, and the scene actually introduces us to probably, arguably, the most tortured individual to ever meet Christ in Pilate. Because if you were to pick somebody that could have been in close proximity, that had the very God of the universe right there to ask him any question to realize who he truly was, and had a chance to do the right thing, it was Pilate. But, Pilate lacked morals, and as we're going to find out, he was very weak emotionally. Now, he, if you read the story, and as we read there, we find out that uh, he is very undecided, as are many of us at times, or have been, as are many people to this day. Some people, they know Jesus, they say, yes, maybe he was a man, all these other things we know about him, we've read about him, we went to church a couple times on Easter and Christmas, and we heard about it, but you know, I'm really not decided on who Jesus is. And I would challenge you and say, if you're one of those people where you're not sure who Jesus is, then you're most likely just like Pilate. You're trying to plead the fifth. You're trying to sit in the middle and not decide one way or the other. And yet, if you decide, I want to sit in the middle, example, Austria, World War II, you pretty much chose. You chose a side because you did nothing. Now, if we go to the end of chapter 18, Pilate had gone out to the Jews who were accusing Jesus, and he said to them, I find no basis for a charge against him. Okay. I find no basis for a charge against him. But in light of that, we discover as we go into 19 and verse 1, Pilate had him flogged. If you read verse 1, it says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. So if you find no basis for a charge against him, <clears throat> Excuse me. And you are the Roman governor. You have all the power in your hand at this time. Why are you taking an innocent man and having him flogged? But 
doesn't make sense. Now, to step out in front of the accusers and say that, that I, I find no charge, and to go ahead and put him with the, the cruelty of a flogging, and if for those of you who are not quite aware of what flogging is, it's, I'll, I'll put it down in drum down terms because I'm not a smart individual. It's basically like a whip with little shards of metal and bronze and other types of things and bone that would tear into their skin. In fact, most people didn't ever make it to the crucifixion because they got flogged so bad that they died prior to to the crucifixion because they were so weak from it. They would hit you and tear you with all their ferocity to the point where you would see your organs open up. In some cases, you can read that uh, the Romans would do it because they thought it was fun to see the kidneys bared on the back. Well, let's take him and flog him, even though we find no basis against him. Now, lesser mortals wouldn't have made it through. But Jesus did. And again, I find no basis for a charge against him. So my question is, Pilate, what is wrong with you? So the cruelty of verse 1, if we go on to verse 2 and 3, then you, if we say we have a mock of of a trial, we actually have a mock of a coronation because as we read, they took a crown of thorns, crushing it onto his head, uh, taking a purple robe, putting it around him, to be worn by uh, Jesus, and then uh, they dress him up, basically to make fun of him. Not the type of dress up you and I played when we were children, where mom might have pinned on the dish towel with clothespins, and you were Superman, you jumped off the ledge, and you still got the scar to prove it. I really did think I could fly. No, they made a mockery of him. And just in case you think humanity couldn't do something so evil and so gross, uh, we read in John 19, after having twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and clothed him in a purple robe, they went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And in some versions that say they slapped him in the face, other translations say they struck him in the face. And for what? What did he do that was so bad? That he deserved that? Was it because he healed a lady who was bent over double for 18 years? Brought Lazarus back from the grave? For taking children on his knee and telling his disciples of such is the kingdom of heaven. I don't get it. I don't understand. Why would you smack? I can't hit anybody in the face in the first place, really, unless I'm going to fight anyway, let alone to mock somebody. And yet Jesus subjected himself to that. So now we go on. Pilate presents Jesus, brings him out. Verse 4, he says to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you now to let you know that I find no basis or charge against him. I'm sorry, what? No charge or basis against him. So you brought him out to the crowd, why? If there is no charge, why don't you just release him? Let him go. Let him walk free. Pretty simple. But see, Pilate couldn't do that because Pilate was a conflicted man. And then he thought, if I bring him out with this crown of thorns and this robe and presumably a scepter and um, a reed, a scepter, pardon me, um, bringing him out, he might induce some type of sympathy where you might see that. I'd like to think all of us sitting in here, if we did that, we brought somebody out, something like that, our hearts would break to an extent, we'd have sympathy. The last time I was able to do this, uh, I put a picture up of a young girl with a vulture not 10 feet behind and I watched your faces and you all were like, oh, and you had sympathy. So that's what Pilate's doing here. He's thinking, well, maybe I can get off the hook here. Maybe after I've flogged him, which I'm not sure I survived, maybe after we do this and we mock him and we bring him out, they'll be like, you know what, it's okay. Never mind, it'll be all right. Pilate goes on to say, look, do you think this is a king? Do you think this is the basis of insurrection? Do you think this man is a revolutionary about to overturn the world? Look at him, another translation says, 
Behold the man. Now, our kids like to say, like, I'm him, I'm the man, I'm this, I'm that. You can see your teenagers smiling and chuckling a little bit. They say, I'm them, I am that guy. And my retort is, you don't want to be that guy. There's another guy you might want, but he's not that guy. But there was never a man like this in all perfection. This isn't Jesus Christ superstar. This is the man of sorrows. Scripture tells us was acquainted with grief. This is the son of man before men, whom men hid their faces. And now we're mocking him. So I guess my question is, do you grasp that this morning? Because when I was preparing this late last night and early this morning, going through things, that I can't get it. I don't understand why someone would do this willingly. And there's no movie in Hollywood that can make it what it really is, as close as we might get. This is the king of the universe. God incarnate, the one who could call down the legions. It says scripture, I could call 12 legions of angels and the whole thing would be finished in a moment. Those are the movies we like, aren't they? Yeah, giddy. That guy's got what's coming to him. Take care of that. We don't grasp this movie. We don't grasp this moment. We don't truly understand and really let it penetrate our hearts. But see, he went down that road anyway. And he did it for you. Now, you all know what I'm talking about because we're all the same to an extent. We're just like sheep. We go astray. We do dumb things. We do stuff, say things that we shouldn't say, and we do all of that. But if we really, truly let it penetrate at our heart, that this man who is now mocked, who is beaten, Pilate's trying to get off the hook, and he's standing there, bleeding, dying for you and I, and the whole time he's standing there, he's got D. Barnett in his mind's eye. He's got your name, my name, on the palm of his hand. Pilate says, behold, the man. No truer words were ever spoken. So we go on in scripture, as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, catch this, if you look at these people, and they shouted, crucify, crucify. Pilate, that one kind of backfired, didn't it, buddy? Didn't work out so well, did it? No sympathy. Nothing. Bloodthirst, but no sympathy. If you can picture it, they're standing there in religious robes, out in the crowd, where else they're at. Remember, they're held in high esteem. They're out there, and they, oh, man, just let him have it. Get it over with, Pilate. Take it. So instead of having a lump in your throat, instead of maybe feeling that gut-wrenching turn like this is wrong, crucify, crucify. And again and again, they cry it. See, they haven't played their ace card yet. For those of you who play poker, I don't because I'm bad at it. I'm like terrible. I went one time and I played for like pennies and nickels. I don't remember how much I took that one. It was terrible. I had nothing. That's how bad. I lost pennies, people. I'm that bad at poker. It's not good. But they don't let him off the hook. Okay, Pilate. It's pretty good, buddy. But let's not stop there. Let's go ahead and go all the way. Finish him. But Pilate replies, I would imagine in frustration, you take him and crucify him. You want a crucifixion? You do it. Because after all, I find no basis or charge against him. Remember, I told you we're going to keep going back to that. And Pilate holds this power, but he is a conflicted man. He's convicted to an extent, I'd like to think, if he keeps saying, I find no basis for the charge, but he won't let him go. Why not, Pilate? 
well, the crucify, crucify, crucify. It rings in his ear. He wants them to take him and crucify him. And now he knows he's in a real predicament. And any of you that have studied history whatsoever, okay, if you actually paid attention in school, history is actually pretty cool, people. It's because you didn't pay attention, did you? Roman government kind of had its steps, right? Caesar was the man in their time. And he knows that he's got to do right by Caesar. He actually hates these people, by the way. He hates the Pharisees. He doesn't like what they stand for. He doesn't want them around there, but he knows he has to do this because something's going to happen. So the Jews come back in verse 7, and then they, they kind of get him here. We've got a law, and according to that law, Jesus has to die. See, they waited. They haven't completely got him yet, but they say, Pilate, you know the law, buddy. You've got to go ahead. You've got to take this. We can't do it, but you can. Because Roman jurisdiction allowed them to govern their own affairs, and he couldn't change any of that. But he had to die. Why? Because he claimed to be the son of God. And so they go on and they manipulate him. And you go to verse 8. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. See, this is why he's probably the most tortured man in the Bible. If any of you have ever been in charge of anything, you've been a, maybe you've been the boss, maybe you're in charge of your own department, anything else like that, you've always had something that's taken place that's happened. You've probably struggled with your heart and your conviction about what you should or shouldn't do. Your boss is saying this, but you know in your heart, like, ah, ugh. Don't know if I can do that. And so you get really, really conflicted. Now, that's on a very minute scale. Put yourself in the place of Pilate. You're the Roman governor. You want nothing to do with this. There's something about this guy that you can't quite get. Your wife, the night before, couldn't sleep. She even warned you this morning while you're getting your scrambled eggs and bacon and all the other stuff, like, man, leave this guy alone. Don't do it. but he was even more afraid. Now, Pilate knew a little bit about gods and goddesses. Again, if you studied your, your Roman mythology, your Greek mythology, that type of thing, you'd have an idea. But to him, uh, you know, he didn't understand that he was actually right there with the Son of God, uh, if not God himself. But he's trying to get out of this predicament. And his fear is just overwhelming. And his, again, like I said, his wife tossing and turning word of caution, whatever happens, have nothing to do with that innocent man. Now, here's the problem, gentlemen. How many of you actually would have listened to your wife at that point in time? I would have. You kidding me? I just want her to listen to me when I talk. So you see how it all moves around in Pilate's mind, how conflicted he's getting. I find no charge, so let's flog him. And now he's got the guilt. Man, let's have this guy flogged. It's pretty brutal treatment. I thought maybe if I did that, that would be enough to satisfy these people. And then he's thinking, hey, I can justify it. I'll put him out there. They'll have sympathy. That doesn't work. And instead, it creates fury. And their fury creates his frustration. And his frustration simply says, do it yourself. And their forcefulness says, we can't, but you can. And their forcefulness leads to his fearfulness. So he's jammed. If you look at the verbs, in and out. So see, this is what happens when you're a teacher. You start going back to everything. So I'm sorry, I referenced history class. Now we're talking English. I apologize. Notice I have not said anything about math. We won't go there. But in and out. So if we go back to uh, chapter 18, verse 29, Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing? In verse 33, Pilate then went back in and summoned Jesus. In verse 38, what is truth, Pilate asked. And with this, he went out. And in verse 1 of chapter 19, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and he goes back in. And in verse 4, once again, he comes out. 
And in verse 9, once again, he goes back in. It's like the cat on the hot tin roof, right? Can't decide what he wants to do. Should I be in? Should I be out? It's kind of like when it gets in the weather. You put the hoodie on, you're like, I'm cold. Then I got too warm. I got to say, nope, now I'm cold. Those of you who coach track, you know what I'm talking about. But he's got Christ, like the hound of heaven, just bearing down on him, and he can't figure it out. And he keeps on going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he can't evade this man. There's something about him. There's a challenge in him that he can't quite get past, and he can't get to the bottom. So he's got to ask him some questions because he doesn't understand why he's not doing anything. So it brings us to three questions, verses 9 and 10. Question number one, he goes back inside to the palace, and he says to Jesus, where do you come from? Where do you come from? But Jesus gives him no answer. Not that it would have mattered. If Jesus would have said, well, I come from heaven, Pilate probably would have scoffed at him, laughed at him, said, I've heard of plenty of gods, but not you. But Pilate didn't have any interest in that at all. He just wanted to find something out. So he goes on to question number two. Do you refuse to speak to me? Now in Greek, it actually says, to me, you do not speak, question mark. To me? Pilate's pulling rank. It's kind of ironic though, actually, isn't it? But Pilate's pulling rank. How can you not talk to me? Do you not know who I am? I'm the Roman governor. Don't you think you should probably speak to me? Kind of makes you think of the story of Naaman in the Old Testament. Remember Naaman got the leprosy and the servant girl said, hey, there's this prophet Elijah. If you go to him, he can help you out and maybe take care of your leprosy. And so they get all of it together you can kind of imagine in your head Naaman gets all this big old cord and they take the caravan down and pulls up outside the house excuse me and uh, he's thinking okay there's gonna be some miraculous thing that's gonna happen I'm gonna be cured of this leprosy it's gonna be great and of course the man of God doesn't even come out of the house instead he sends a servant to him and here's what the servant says so why don't you go and dip yourself in the Jordan seven times and then from Naaman, you get the same response that Pilate just gave. Really? He clearly doesn't know who I am. Go ahead, pack up, boys. We're moving on. Oh, and you want me to go into the Jordan River? The Jordan River, by the way, is kind of like your ponds that you have in your backyard or fishing ponds, right? It's all yuck and gross. It's not the beautiful, nice, clear stuff. So for a guy like Naaman, that was a slap in the face, too. Like, I can't believe you didn't come out first of all, and just do some miracle for me. And second of all, you sent a servant. And third of all, I've got to go to the Jordan? Dude, I take baths and cleaner water than that my servants prepare. Gross. But did you know this morning that there's some people in here, that's why you're not a Christian? Because you have the same mentality. You're stuck on the fact that Jesus is not impressed with you. Because the way to get to you is to impress you. Show me how important I am. In fact, some of us have lived our entire lives that way. We've lived to the standpoint of like, hey, this is my title. This is my job. This is who I am impress me and so you come to Christ and just like Pilate you say to me why don't you speak to me I got this problem God why aren't you taking care of it show me a miracle don't you know who I am why don't you take care of it if you're so good who do you think you are by the way I'm not pinpointing on anybody because as my wife can attest to, I can be the same exact way. How come you didn't take care of that, God? I did everything you asked. Where are you at?
You'd read in my journal that I write. I told her, I said, boy, when, when I die, you're going to get some stories. Don't let the kids read it. And you probably need to skip certain ones. But see, we think we're so wonderful that Christ should just take care of things that, uh, for us. But who are we? Well, let's be honest. It's a wonder why Christ would ever come to any of us. That's why when a person is truly redeemed, when they truly make a profession of faith and they've really accepted Christ in their heart, see, it doesn't make them more proud. It makes them more humble. So where do you come from? Jesus gave no answer. You refuse to speak to me. And he follows it up with the third punch. Do you realize, don't you realize, pardon me, that I have the power to either free you or to crucify you? And if you really get down to it, this is Pilate's dilemma. That's it right there. I've got the power in my hand to free you or I've got the power to crucify you. It's on me, Jesus. Why don't you say something? He keeps trying to sidestep it. We go back and we look at it. You crucify him. I find no charge against him. You take him. He wants to be able to say, this isn't my problem. But he looks us straight in the face. Jesus, don't you get it? This is my problem. Help me out here, man. Say something. Do something. Because I possess that power. And he's telling the truth. But then Jesus says, let me tell you something. You wouldn't have any power whatsoever if it were not given to you from above. In other words, earthly rulers may act only as God permits. No one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to pick it up again. See, Jesus already said that. He was freely giving his life. He could have easily changed that. He could have easily taken care of the whole situation. He could have talked to Pilate. Everything would have been fine. But that's not what took place. He goes on to say, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. So as a result of a little interchange, we go on to verse 12, and Pilate tries to set Jesus free, but uh, the Jews kept shouting, and this is when they play that ace card. If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, if you want a spot where it's kind of the final nail for, uh, for Pilate, oof, you got me. You got me. Because he knows the right thing to do. He's feeling it in his heart. He wants to let him go. But he can't do it because if he does, it probably means death for him is what it means. And he knows these guys are going to go ahead and turn him over. But some of you, as I said earlier, that's why you haven't come to Christ, because you haven't truly put your faith in Christ. See, you knew about him. You read the Bible a few times. You came on Easter and Christmas. Maybe mom or dad, you grew up in a household where they read scripture and they took you to church and they tried to raise you in the way of the church. And for whatever reason, you've gone astray and you've fallen off. You could still quote some scripture in there but you've never actually known him or trusted him. Because if you, it means if you did, you'd have to admit that you were wrong. Because what we do on Monday through Saturday matters more to us than what happens when we come in here on Sunday. And then we're afraid to actually be a Christian out in public. Because if I am, they might not accept me. I was telling Terry... When I got the text from my class night, it was over at a football clinic over in Pittsburgh for our college football stuff. And normally we stay over and we do a church thing on Sunday and then we go. And I told my supervisor, I said, I got to go back. I said, I'm going to have to get back there early. Uh, I got to prepare for the sermon and things like that. He says, okay. And Phil's a great guy. But some of these guys, they like to drink. Their mouths are, uh, I wondered why they kiss or if they kiss their moms with those mouths. Uh, some of them. And one of them I get along with really well and I'd been helping him out through some sessions, and he says, why, you got to go? He goes, man, I was going to have you do this. I said, yeah, I got to leave early. What do you got to leave for? I said, well, I've got to go ahead and prepare to give the sermon at church. Oh. 
Because what I didn't put in that part was a couple of the words that he used prior to that, because that's how he talks. But it made him really uncomfortable. And I grabbed him and I said, Phil, I'll see you next, or I'll see you in a couple weeks when we do a scrimmage together. Okay. But see, we would rather keep certain things under wrap. Because if we truly knew Christ, then we'd have to go back to those same, same people, whether they're in your household, whether they're in your neighborhood, whether they're in your place of work, and be like, you know what? I didn't know Christ at all. I went on Sundays. I occasionally opened up my Bible. I did this and I did that to try to reach the bare minimum, but I really did not know him. Some of us are that close, but we're so afraid of what might happen if we actually go through with it. So let me ask you this question. Who would you rather offend? Does it scare you more to admit to your friends that you've actually never been a Christian than to stand before the bar of God's judgment and tell Christ that the reason you never trusted him was because the people with whom you worked, with whom maybe you played cards with, you went to school with, whoever it may be, you're afraid to tell them. Which one are you more scared of? I find no reason to bring any charge against him, but I can't let him go. I find every reason to trust him, but I can't bring myself to do it. You see, the problem in Pilate was really his morality and just a moral deficiency, basically the inability to do the right thing no matter what. It was all about self-preservation and self-promotion. Got to get that job, got to go. And it made me wonder, just because I've had these talks with my children at times, what his father was like. What were the conversations like? Did his dad give him every request that he wanted? When he threw a temper tantrum, did he give in? Let Pilate get what he wanted? When he messed up, did he make sure he covered up his faults, swept it under the rug so nobody would know? Or did he actually let him go through the consequences? They let him grow up living to a double standard. So now we get to the final blow. You're no friend of Caesar. And oh, how Pilate must have been annoyed. And he probably was extremely enraged, I would think, at their hypocrisy. Because they really didn't care about loyalty at that point. They couldn't care less about Caesar. Remember, they get to do their own little thing, right? In the Roman government. They kind of govern themselves. They simply were using this. We'll tell Caesar that you condone a rebellion. We'll tell Caesar that you're the one, Pilate, that released the king of Israel. And they knew there was no rebellion on the part of Christ. You see, every man has his price. And here's Pilate's. So finally he exceeds. He ignores any superstitions he might have or any promptings, uh, anything that his wife told him at breakfast. He ignores everything in his core that said, if I actually had the intestinal fortitude, if I had the courage to actually stand up and do the right thing, I would simply release this man. But instead, he sits down on his judge's seat. And with his conscience drowned by loud voices, he compromises because Pilate is a coward. And if we go in the text, if we see, we notice how the uh, gospel writer, he pinpoints the time. It's kind of like on the news or on one of those TV shows, you know, when they announce the time of death or at 10.02 p.m. so-and-so, this was done. Does it right there in Scripture. It was the day of preparation of the Passover week, and it was right around the sixth hour. And Pilate stood up and said, here is your king. And their fiendish chants reverberated his reaction, take him away crucify him. And Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? And then here's a great answer for a good Jew. 
we have no king but Caesar. And that's right. Because at that point in time, when they wanted to crucify Christ, the only king they truly had was Caesar. A political figurehead was all they had to go to. Because they just wanted to submit, or they wanted to submit to Caesar, and they simply wanted Christ to be gone and out of there. Now, if we go to the Gospel of Matthew, he tells us that Pilate uh, washes his hands, a symbol of his attempted evasion. He says, I'm innocent, and it's your responsibility. Uh, verse 6, pardon me, let me back up. He then goes on, and the response of the people was, let his blood be upon us and our children. In verse 16, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. And the people murmured, let his blood be upon us and our children. Now, don't think for a second tonight that if Jesus came to Fredonia, we put it, he's coming down to the square, that uh, all the people would fall down in front of him and they'd worship him. Because they wouldn't. You know why they wouldn't? Stubbornness. Pride. Rebellion. The very thing that keeps a man or woman from bowing beneath his kingship. And as the praise team comes forward, there's another section of our building right over here. Normally I'm back there this time of day helping Caden out with the children's church. There's a whole host of them. Little itty bitties to a little bit bigger bitties. They're all back there. And they're learning about who Christ is and what he means. And we encourage them each time we're back there about, you know, we want to accept Christ. This is why we did this. We go through this. We don't go in great detail like I've done this morning, but we said, you know, he died for you and I. And some of you freely send your children back there. Some of you even bring them to Sunday school or on Wednesday nights, and you allow them to go and you do that. And yet some of you don't come on a Wednesday night or to Sunday school, but you know enough in this world that is crazy, you know enough in this world that's a mess, that all of you are frightened by what's going to happen to my child, what are they going to do when they grow up, how are they going to make it, because it's bad enough now, what's it going to be 20 years from now? So you know enough, you just haven't fully accepted. Oh, sure, we might play the part Monday through Saturday here and there. But we've really not taken a look. We've really not taken a look at our own heart and said, why? Because unfortunately, the opinion of those who we work with, even some of our family members, their opinions matter more than Christ. So as we close, let me ask you this final question. Do your colleagues in the office really concern you that much that you would give up on Christ? You would give up his forgiveness, his love, and what he did for you. You would give up heaven, and to be quite blunt, go to hell as a tortured soul, just like Pilate. If you have a decision to make as we stand and sing, please come forward. Thank you.